Uh, welcome everybody to this Claren Cafe, um, introducing you to the SSH Open Marketplace and specifically uh, how workflows are handled in there. Um, I'm Alexander König from Claren Eric. I'm going to be hosting uh, this cafe. And with me are my two uh, co-presenters, Christina Rizzo from Claren Switzerland and Michael Kurzmeier from ACDHCH in Vienna. So what are we going to talk about today? As always, we start with a quick opening to tell you the good word about Claren. Then um, Christina is going to talk about the marketplace, what it is and why you should be using it. Then I will be talking a bit about specifically how Claren relates to the marketplace. Um, and then Michael will tell you a bit how workflows, um, how you can create your own workflows in the marketplace. And in the end, we will have um, some time for Q&A and discussion and questions and whatever you want to get off your chest. Claren, um, yeah, you, if you've been to a Claren Cafe before, you know the slide. This is um, the standard Claren in eight uh, bullet points. Claren is the, the common language resources, the technology infrastructure. Trust me, the acronym makes sense. Um, we are an S3 um, uh, infrastructure and an ERIC. Um, what are we doing? We actually, we are about um, um, creating and then providing easy and sustainable access um, for researchers, scholars in the sci social sciences and humanities, SSH. Um, and especially we deal with um, language data, digital language data, be it written, spoken, video, multimodal. Um, we deal with tools. So software, you need to need to work with this language data, for example, annotation tools or part of speech taggers or these kind of things. And we provide a single sign-on environment. That means you can use, um, usually you can use your normal university account to log in with any Clarence center, any Clarence service and just use it. Claren also um, has an ecosystem for knowledge exchange. We have uh, things that are called so-called knowledge centers. So basically um, places within the cloud infrastructure that um, specific, um, have sp knowledge on a specific um, specific field of, of expertise um, and that you can contact and that will help you out with, with uh, problems in this kind of, uh, in this specific domain. And we are also working in the EOSC, whatever that exactly means, but we are working with together with the other um, research infrastructures as, as much as we can. Yeah, Claren is about open science. So I'll just um, quickly go through this. Basically, what we, um, yeah, we about um, the main point of Claren is what we call a Claren Center, which are, or usually are, apart from the centers, are um, data repositories. So they offer data and or services. Um, to the research community as a whole and to the Claren community. And we as Claren make sure um, that the interoperability is there so that um, you can use um, the, the most tools on the most data sets without um, having any issues. And as I said, we also offer this single sign-on environment where you can basically um, yeah, log in with your account anywhere and use the stuff that is open for use. Yeah, we are take we are especially uh, focusing on the fair principles apart from open science. So basically, uh, we every or not everything, but most of the data sets and, and tools in Claren have persistent identifiers. That means you can trust that the link will not not rot away within a year, but you can just bookmark this uh, person identifier, and then you will always be able to to access the the data set. Um, yeah, we have a specific metadata um, environment. We have a licensing framework. And as that there are the repositories, these trusted repositories that are certified by the Quattro seal and also assessed by Claren on top of that. So this is uh, the Claren uh, landscape. We are currently have uh, 24 member countries and two observers. Um, yeah, and we are so mostly it's Europe, it's a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, but we also have uh, South Africa as a member and we have uh, a single center in the US for the moment. Uh, yes, so hello everyone. 
I hope it's working. So my name is Kisna Vizo. I'm working in Switzerland. Um, on my background, you see Clarin CH, Daria CH, and Shock CH. So I'm actually working um, both for Clarin uh, and for Daria, which is a sustainable structure uh, dealing with arts and humanities. And um, at the cluster level, so social sciences and humanities, we also are the lucky ones to have created a Shock CH Association. So an association which is um, gathering all uh, research infrastructures and uh, yeah, from the SSH field and we're travel, travel, uh, trying to, to move forward with this. So um, I'm, I'm mentioning it because the SSH Open Marketplace is actually one of the results of this uh, first European shock project or idea of, of having a, uh, um, a cluster for social sciences and uh, humanities. And it's in really in this role that I've um, also enrolled in the um, uh, SSH Open Marketplace editorial board two years ago to, to support uh, sharing and uh, uh, of resources from the SSH field um, at, the, at the European level, so well beyond the national borders of the European level. So um, I will have a few slides just to say, to show you what is the SSH Open Marketplace and why we think that every researcher from the SSH field and beyond should be using it. So the, the, the driving principle or the background principle is that of the fact that discoverability and findability of research services and products are essential to enable sharing and reuse of workflows and uh, methodologies. And the SSH marketplace is a discovery platform. So um, this is where, we'll do, uh, uh, where we want to, um, to, to, to go to enhance this um, uh, reuse uh, and of workflows and methodologies. So how it started, um, so uh, a few years ago in the community, so it started in, in the DH community, so you'll have the name of, of Daria a few times on this slide. So roughly in the DH community, it was just this recent field called digital humanities and, and researchers in the community started to wondering about transferring knowledge among the members of the community. So there were some blog posts and mailing, mailing lists and articles and online portals. And the question then uh, rapidly came of how to render this more systematic and more sustainable. And again, there were some, some um, uh, um, options there. Uh, and, um, and in the Daria um, infrastructure, um, the, the idea was to develop Daria as a social marketplace for services. And then um, it continued uh, in the shock project, as I mentioned, which was uh, a project funded by the European Union uh, in the framework of Horizon 2020, uh, with more than 20 partner organizations and uh, associate uh, partners. And the aim was to develop the SSH cluster uh, within uh, the European Open Science Cloud. And the, the mission of, of the project was to transform the SSH data lens landscape with, with, with its disciplinary silos and facilities into an integrated cloud-based network of interconnected uh, data infrastructures. And this data infrastructure would be supported by tools and training to allow scholars to better have access, process, analyze, and reach and compare uh, data across boundaries of disciplines uh, individual repositories and uh, institutions. And then when the, the project ended in 2022, uh, three infrastructures, so Clarin, Daria, and CESA, which is the similar infrastructure for social science, they decided to create this SSH open cluster to give a, um, you know, a follow-up of these, all these good results that were created during the shock project and the marketplace is one of these main um, results. So in practice, how does it work? So these three ERICs that I just mentioned, they have a service uh, um, agreement. Um, they have members in the, gov the governing board of the uh, uh, open cluster. They um, and the, the technical service provision is provided by uh, um, these two institutions here, so one in Vienna and one in Poland. And uh, we have also an editorial board, which is uh, supporting the, um, yeah, the functioning of the marketplace in practice. So as I said, one, um, one of the volunteers um, <clears throat> who joined and this uh, board uh, includes so eight appointed members so from the ERICs. 
and also nine volunteers as me from different countries or also different uh, backgrounds. Uh, and we, we, have, we have a series of activities that we do on behalf of the editorial board to ensure it's uh, daily um, operational. In terms of visitor and contributors, so the marketplace it's, um, it's starting to be, it's, it's, it's again very new, uh, but it has started to become a uh, usual um, yeah, um, platform that is uh, known by uh, researchers and used. And we also, um, um, uh, so there are a lot of e items that are created manually. And some of them are also created during um, um, hands-on sessions, uh, which allow to enrich or create existing, uh, enrich existing uh, entries or create new ones. So it's all a, a um, community uh, joint effort. So this is how it looks. Um, and here, what you see on the right side of my slide, it's the, um, the, the number of items that we have now in the different categories. Um, so it's, as you see, we already have quite a lot of items. I will then present the, the categories just a bit later to see what actually, what kind of, of um, resources one can find on the marketplace. Um, here you can see the list of uh, sources that are used to um, uh, automatically uh, um, populate the marketplace. So they are um, uh, in, uh, harvested uh, by the marketplace or in automatically ingested. So you can see here that we have resources from uh, Daria, uh, also from SESTA, um, the Clarion Language Resource Switchboard, um, and, and some other resources that uh, the Clarion Resource Families and some other sources that are used to populate the, the marketplace. This is for the automatic part. And of course, as I said, um, um, you know, individual uh, researchers or uh, people can also um, add manually uh, individual uh, resources. So there are five types of uh, content uh, in on the marketplace. Um, the first one is, uh, as you can see here, tools and services. So we have uh, both, um, you know, uh, desktop client solutions or in web-based or, you know, yeah, web-based uh, um, uh, services and uh, everything that is tools and service, it's uh, uh, together. Um, then data sets, of course, um, from the from the SSH field. So maybe these one, the two of them, the, the first and so the tools and services and data sets are a, a type of resources that can be also findable easily be findable in other um, or individually in the research infrastructures we have named. Um, and in addition to these, uh, which are the most frequent ones, we also in the marketplace there are also training materials. So everything that can uh, use or any kind of resource that can be um, used to explain how to perform certain actions or to um, uh, highlight some learning outcomes, uh, publications, and um, which which with the very important specific uh, thing that we in the marketplace the purpose is to have only uh, publications that can be connected to another resource and um, uh, not simply a publication from the field. So it has to be connected either with a course service or a training material or both, or to a specific data set. And, um, and finally, the fifth type of resource of, of content that we can have in the marketplace is workflows, which is a, one of the most original types of, uh, of resources So workflows, which uh, are defined as sequences of operation or steps that can be performed on research data uh, during the life cycle. And um, at the end of the last part of this presentation today, we'll focus on how to create workflows and why these workflows are uh, a very novel and timely um, uh, way of disseminating uh, research results or knowledge uh, within the community. Um, and here, just for the um, uh, talk today, I, I played around, uh, for example, with just the keyword NLP, so natural language processing, uh, to see what we can find in the marketplace. And this is an example of a resource coming from the Clarion community. So if you are coming from the Clarion community, you know very well um, uh, this kind of resource. Um, uh, because as I said, um, the, the Clarion resource families is one of the um, 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 sources that has been um, 
uh, harvested into the marketplace. But one can also find other so or so this is an example for fruits and services. Uh, as you can see here, it's not coming from the Clarin community, but it's nevertheless relevant for NLP. So this is um, a tool service for multilingual NLP for archaeological reports uh, from the Ariadne infra infrastructure. So what I want to show through these uh, two examples, so uh, this one and this one, is the fact that uh, it's important or the marketplace has this advantage of, of giving access or increasing the findability of um, uh, similar resources coming from different sources and which are also focusing on different aspects. So um, uh, the UD pipe, uh, which is the classical NLP tool with the maybe a last classical or specifically for language, uh, built for language uh, type of data coming from um, archaeology um, um, discipline. Um, so this is the, 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 so these are examples for tools and services. Then the second type of um, of uh, resource that one can find on the marketplace is that of training materials. This is an example. So I, I kept the NLP uh, keyword. Okay. So here we have um, language model. Uh, 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 sorry, a bird for humanities. So a deep learning language model meets uh, DH or DH community uh, digital humanities. Um, again, uh, a training material uh, coming from, uh, I don't know exactly what source here, but the discipline that has been associated with digital humanity. So it goes a bit beyond um, what Clarin uh, infrastructure typically covers. Then publications, as I said, publications, the, the, the idea is to reference only publications that are um, related to a specific um, or others, other uh, resources from the marketplace. And here we can have, so it's a publication about NLP pipelines. And these um, publication is uh, linked to, to um, uh, service uh, services, uh, tools and services. And this is one of the so this this context that the marketplace gives via the uh, via these related um, items. And um, finally, this is for data. Um, as you can see again, so here NLP uh, as keyword in the search, and you can have you can see that for NLP as keyword, we can have we have three types of sources uh, for data sets. Uh, most of them are from um, clearing, clearing resource families, but also from humanities data and um, the SSH Open Cloud um, catalog. And the, the fifth one is that of workflows. Um, so here we have for the moment two workflows with the keyword uh, NLP um, that we have the, on the marketplace and we hope to have uh, more in, in uh, the future. So what... <clears throat> What are the key pillars of the marketplace? Um, the first one is contextualization. And this is the one I, I really appreciate a lot because it has this, uh, uh, compared to other um, uh, infrastructure taken in individually where you can ha only have access or you can find individual uh, um, resources. The marketplace really shows this contextualization feature which refers to placing resource in context via the semantic linking. And um, this gives context to tools and services via relevant publications, training materials, data sets, and, and workflows, and really gives really a, a comprehensive picture of what uh, one can find and increases, in my perspective, increases, significantly increases the reusability of those um, uh, resources when you also have access to, to, um, to these um, uh, related um, type of, types of content. Then curation, so um, the curation of the data and metadata um, is uh, done both automatically, uh, but also manually by uh, uh, the members of the editorial board, but also by the members of the community who also can um, uh, curate uh, the, the entrances. <clears throat> so um, it's actually, as I said from the beginning, a community effort. And again, this is something that I, I appreciate a lot on for the marketplace. So uh, the marketplace, the, its content and its contextualization um, function, functionality is the result of collaborative work uh, by members of the community. So SSH community in general, and that's a huge community, and also across countries and across the different uh, um, areas that uh, we uh, represent um, 
for the the governance of the of the marketplace. And how is it possible for uh, people to actually contribute to the marketplace? So um, there are four types of user roles. So the most basic one uh, for which no account is needed is the visitor one. And visitors can consult, browse, discover, and reuse uh, resources. Then the second one is the contributor one, uh, where um, um, a person has to create an account or to um, uh, use um, um, existing accounts. Um, uh, until now, it was the YOSC um, um, authentication system, and now it has recently changed. Nevertheless, anyone can uh, reuse their own um, cred institutional credentials to uh, log into the marketplace. And contributors can, of course, do whatever visitors can, plus can, they can promote, create, and enrich. So create new items, new entries, and enrich the metadata of existing items. Uh, then the third one is the moderator one, uh, which is uh, for people like me, so the member of, member of the editorial board, uh, plus the technical team uh, who can moderate, um, uh, curate, uh, and advise. So we, by moderate, we mean we can we have the rights to validate um, items that have been created and to publish them. And finally, the fifth one, the fourth one is the admin classical thing, so uh, including um, uh, management of users and of uh, sources. Uh, what is a curation puzzle of the marketplace? Because uh, as you have seen, the curation of data and metadata is one of the um, yeah, pillars of the marketplace. So as I said from the beginning, we have the mass ingestion of, of sources. And um, this comes through identification of relevant data sources and harvesting and ingestion into the marketplace. Um, then um, uh, the second piece of the puzzle is the creation of items by um, contributors, so manual creation of items by contributors, and we have the moderation by the members of the editorial board. For the mass ingestion, we also have the curation, uh, some curation prioritization, so we um, can set up curation priorities, for example, the broken links. Uh, or um, let's, uh, let's say what else, adding publications to some of the um, types of items that we have. And we can also organize campaigns to improve the metadata quality. Um, so this is for the mass suggestion and for the uh, manual creation of items, we have the, the enrichment, uh, manual enrichment of metadata fields. Uh, by um, users. Um, we also felt the need of um, explaining why we, we believe or what would be the, the, the biggest advantages of adding resources in the marketplace. I mean, in terms of user uh, to add resources, but of course it's very important also for users who uh, use the marketplace so to find the marketplace to, uh, to find, to, to use the marketplace to find resources. By, but in terms from the perspective of the, of the contributors, those people from the community who want to share resources, and especially when you are a Clarion user, knowing already the, the different tools, or the different yeah, pieces of the Clarion infrastructure who allow to share, of course, uh, uh, resources in a, in a fair, compliant way. So maybe, uh, so if we want to go beyond the, the Clarion infrastructure itself, what we believe it's important, the marketplace really gives this um, increased findability of clearing resources um, for the entire SSH community. So this means promotion of one's work beyond the typical linguistics community or uh, yeah, language, language data community. Um, <clears throat> So this is for the first one, and then Alex, just a bit later, will explain how this can be done actually to uh, to share resources, uh, in clearing resources in the marketplace. Then the second uh, big advantage is, advantage is the findability of these five types of resources via a unique discovery platform. So as I said from the beginning, we regularly easily find data sets and, um, and, and, um, and tools. Um, on using maybe the same system, the same infrastructure, but uh, the marketplace also offers these, um, uh, as I said, um, training materials and uh, publications and workflow. And to have these five types of resources via a unique uh, discovery platform really gives this very comprehensive um, um, 
uh, a way of, of finding resources, which in addition are um, uh, related to by this relations or contextualization. Um, yeah, uh, third, so easy assessment of the usefulness of a resource thanks to the to contextualization provided by the links uh, between the items of the catalog. So as I said, I think these uh, relations uh, significantly improve the reuse the understandability and reusability uh, reusability of resources. Um, a fourth, so a, a novel and timely promotion of one's work in a comprehensive manner by adding, for instance, information about tools, data, training materials in a reusable workflow. So the marketplace um, uh, provides this uh, formal um, framework in which you can, uh, someone, one can um, show step by step. Um, um, yeah, the, the workflow for a specific task and what is needed, uh, like what tool, what uh, data, uh, or what uh, training material is needed at each of the steps. And finally, the fifth um, uh, advantage, uh, which is that of an active involvement in the SSH community, data curation routines uh, by becoming a basic contributor or uh, an advanced um, curator. Uh, so just before adding uh, new resources in the marketplace, uh, and as I just a bit later, Alex will explain how this can be done for clearing um, uh, the resources. Uh, we still have, we do have four principles that we encourage uh, people to to think of uh, for inclusion criteria. So the first one is, uh, will this resource be relevant to the SSH community? Because of course this is an SSH marketplace, so we want to find. Um, uh, resources that are actually relevant for the SSH community. So beyond a um, um, small, let's say, niche um, area, if someone else from the SSH community will actually be interested in, in finding and reusing those resources. Um, maybe so this could be uh, linked to the um, scientific relevance and usefulness and also may be relevant to digital methodologies that are used uh, within the SSH uh, landscape. The second inclusion criteria is what is the technical status of the resource? Is it still maintained? Is it sustainable? Uh, because I mean, if we have some kind of uh, software that was created many years ago and which maybe is not maintained anymore, maybe it's not necessary to actually add it uh, on the marketplace. Um, third, does the resource follow the spirit of open science? Um, so is this resource fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? Uh, or is it contributing to the uptake of open science best practices? Um, uh, because, um, um, again, this is called the SSH open marketplace, so we really want to uh, fully support um, uh, sharing the resources in the spirit of open science. And finally, which is not trivial at all, is the resource already in the marketplace, knowing that we also that we have this um, automatic ingestion of, of resources, it's worth before we actually create manually creating a, a, a new item on the marketplace to check whether the item maybe has already been created via um, automatic ingestion, and maybe the contribution that uh, you could make would be to uh, curate the metadata, for instance, because with this automatic um, ingestion, sometimes the metadata fields are missing or um, um, erroneous, so it's good to have a, a manual checkup of the um, metadata fields. Yeah, that's all on my side. I hope to have convinced you that it's important to, that there is a lot of added value um uh, from sharing resources clearing especially clearing resources or especially if you are a clearing user in the marketplace and now i will give the floor to alex who will actually uh, give a bit more details about uh, clear, how clearing resources can and should be shared in the marketplace As i actually probably won't need my, my full slot but this is it's like the the more clearing perspective first one thing I wanted to add before I forget it, because uh, uh, Christina, I think, didn't mention this. Um, as, as she said, you can um, make an account on the marketplace and you can usually use your your normal um, single sign-on. It's like in the cloud infrastructure. So you can use your your um, 
You can use your university account, for example, to, to log in. But at the moment, you cannot use a Claren account. So that's a, we had this recent change of the system there. So if you don't have a university account, like, like me, and only have a Claren account, <laughs> um, you cannot use that. But we have uh, other options you can use, for example, Orchid to log in there. And that works also fine. Um, so now let me go through this. So um, as, as Christina said, some uh, Claren resources are already in the, the SSH Open Marketplace. So no need for you to, to ingest them. But um, as, as it was said, maybe you want to look at them and enrich them. There are um, the tools coming from the Language Resource Switchboard, which is a, a registry um, for from uh, as Claren maintains of um, web, uh, web actionable services. So basically some linguistic tools that um, you can call via a web API to um, do a certain task on, on a data set, on, on a text usually. So something like uh, lemmatization, uh, tagging, named entry recognition, these kind of things. Um, then there's also the Claren resource families and the tools and data sets from there are also automatically interested in the marketplace and are also updated regularly via a continuous ingest because things are changing there and we need to, that to be reflected in the marketplace. Then we added some central client service by hand, which is the VLO, the, so the virtual collection registry, and uh, I think some, one, two, one or two others. And some Claren national nodes, because Claren, as you know, is this federated infrastructure, some national nodes of Claren or some centers or even some Claren researchers have also started inputting things manually by themselves. I'm gonna quickly go through these things. So the switchboard you can see here is like medium sized. We have like 47 resources at the moment from the switchboard in the SDH open marketplace. Um, and it's also not super um, active there. So every once in a while something is added there, but we don't really have like a huge fluctuation there. Um, then we have the resource families. As you see, this is a lot. There, I think there are like 20 something different resource families at the moment, um, which vary in various sizes. And they all got added here um, automatically doing this automatic ingest, ingest. And here as well, we do a continuous ingest to catch new additions or deletions or changes that happen in the resource families. Um, yeah, then um, I'm not sure if this is even visible, if it's big enough, but here I noticed that, for example, the German node of Claren Text Plus um, have started adding a lot of their stuff um, into the SSH Open Marketplace. And I think we also saw some things from Claren Poland and maybe also other Claren national nodes. So we, we don't really coordinate this, but people are free to to add their things and just make sure that, that you say that it's Claren somewhere. That would be nice of you. Um, yeah. Um, so the question is, how do you add your Claren resources to the marketplace? So um, ideally, you don't. <laughs> ideally, you go through either the language resource switchboard. If it's if it fits there, if it's a web, web actionable service, something with a web API, you can add it to the language resource switchboard. It will automatically appear in the marketplace. And or if it fits in one of the resource families. So there are various um, families for different types of data sets, for example, CMC data, learner data, um, pa um, parallel corpora, and so on. There's various families for tools, for example, for an entity recognition. Um, and there are also some families for uh, lexical, once again, um, lexical data sets. So, and if you have something that you want to add to the marketplace that could also fit into one of the Claren resource families, please add it there, and then it will automatically appear in the marketplace. And only um, if these things don't apply to you, for you have, I don't know, you have a, have a tool or data set that doesn't fit in, the, in any of the resource families or your, your tool cannot be added to the to switchboard because it's a web, uh, it's a the desktop application or something like that. And it also doesn't fit in any of the resource families that we have for tools, then, um, yeah, follow, of course, the inclusion criteria. Do you think it's, uh, is it maintained? And is it, do you think it's useful for other people? Then you can add it directly into the marketplace. Um, and some things that are typical 
as I mentioned here, are the especially the training materials and workflows because um, yeah, and publications, I guess, um, because these are not covered by the resource families or the switchboard. So these you basically have to add here directly or via some other source. For example, that's Daria Campus, I think, for training materials. You could also go through there, but I think the Daria people are better, um, should know better to what how this would work. Um, but as I said, if you have something that fits in the resource families or the language resource switchboard, then please go there, add it there, because then we have the additional advantage that it's also there um, and visible through this other this other way to to the Clarence community, and it doesn't just um, appear only in the marketplace, which is also nice. But it's it's better if it appears in both, and it's like the same amount of work for you. Yeah, Bram. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so I have a question about. Uh, um, you talked about where we should publish our materials, and so we have this hierarchy of what is harvesting from where and all, all those things. Mm -hmm. But then my question is, where should we direct our users to? Should they... That depends a bit on what they're looking for. <laughs> um, the the marketplace is... is uh, gives us, I think, the advantage there is that you have this contextualization, so you can have the connection between, for example, a data set and a tool that was used to create it, or you have a publication about the data set directly added. Um, but, for example, if you're looking for, like, especially if you're looking for data sets, um, then the, the Claren VLO is, is a much broader, it has much, much more stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's I mean, there's some overlap. There's some resource families which are in the VLO, but also in the resource families and also in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. But if you're um, looking for um, for data sets, the, the Claren VLO, I think, is the best place to, to look. But if you're looking for tools, for example, I think the marketplace is actually, uh, a, at the moment, is still a, a better place. We're looking uh, mm -hmm. at increasing the, the usability of the VLO for tools. But that will probably still take some more months. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm I'm asking because I'm part of Ashok NL, and mm -hmm. we're um, working on a task on uh, data enrichment and evaluations and the tools to do those things. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of thinking of of where should we, what kind of hub should we use to place training materials as well as links to tools, so that indeed the, the question that the presentation started with is. How can we make it easier for users to find the right tools to do these things? Mm -hmm. And so from, from looking at the presentation, I my guess would be that the marketplace would be a good step. If, so if it's directing, about, yeah. mm -hmm. directing the users to the marketplace, but then we should submit the tools ourselves to Claren VLO, perhaps better. Um, if you well, can... So if you submit it to the VLO, they will not appear in the, the marketplace. There's no connection between those at the moment. Um okay. for, for look, so but if you want if you care about the contextualization, the, the marketplace is uh, I think the right place to to have them there. If you have mm -hmm. tools um and data sets, you might you, they might fit into one of the resource families. So mm -hmm. that might that would be a good place, and then they will automatically appear in the marketplace. Um I think Christina okay. wanted to say something. I just, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask more like what, uh, so what kind of, um, not what field or to what area the resource you're, you're referring to? Is it only language resources or is it more general from the SSH field? Because you said that you're from Shock NL. So depending on what level and if you want to do it this in a systematic way or, uh, so yeah, yeah, maybe you yeah. can give a bit more information about what exactly and then we can suggest. Yeah, so ideally it would be more SSH as a whole, uh, but we start mm -hmm. off with more the fields that we are uh, from our own background, and those are more linguistic fields. So that's why I was confused a little mm -hmm. bit as well with Clarin and then yeah. SSH as Ashok. As so, um, but for in the in the long term, it would be SSH as a whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, I think that what um, Alex just said, so if it's a tool that fits in the switchboard, just go through the switchboard and then it will appear on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. If it's um, data that fits into the resource families categories, which are quite uh, you know uh, strict categories, then use this one. If not, then you can add them directly on the marketplace. 
And then for the other so training materials, also on, directly on the marketplace. And what is good is that uh, then you can go back on the marketplace and just enrich the metadata because some sometimes the metadata you uh, that you can have on the switchboard it's maybe not informative enough. But with respect to the metadata from the marketplace. Um, and then it depends if you want to do this manually or uh, to have some automatic harvesting uh, again. So mm -hmm. it would be maybe good to reach out to the editorial board once you have, yes. you know, once once you are ready to actually move forward with this in a systematic way and uh, uh, schedule a meeting to uh, explain exactly what kind of resources you have and how you want to proceed also in terms of, you know, number. And then we can orient you towards, um, it, it might be a mixed um, approach actually, some through the clearing resource families and switchboard and some directly on the marketplace. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sounds yes. good, sounds interesting. Yeah, I, wa I wanted to say the same exactly. Uh, once you have it a bit clearer, reach out to us and then we can, can look at how we can do it best. One more question I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a small one, uh, or maybe it's it's future work or something like that? Um, in in terms of quality of not so much tools, because I, I suppose researchers will find out what tools are, but for training materials, I think that's an important one. Um, to get a, an idea of the quality of training materials, is there any plans how to do that? I can imagine like user rating or stuff like that. Because if, if everybody intends to put on their training materials there, it can be, it could become uh, big differences in terms of quality, right? And so I'm thinking maybe a bit too far ahead, but then of, of mm. students sharing their um, course notes and stuff like that. So on the one hand, you would like to have a lot of training materials, but then that gives rise to more noise being added to the materials as well. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you um, if I can answer from what I've seen. I mean, in the last two years that I'm member of this editorial board, it's more like we would like to have like training materials which are actually you know thought or designed and thought as training materials that are relevant and um, linked to a specific maybe tool or maybe ideally also who which is also on the marketplace. And I wouldn't qualify, uh, you know, uh, uh, course notes uh, as a training material. So it's more like from the perspective, if you have, if you are a teacher and you are giving a course on, I don't know exactly what the scientific, well, you know, uh, um, activity from the DH area or uh, NLP or whatever, and you have actually a designed course with, you know, that, that that's a different approach and that would, would go. Yeah. And of course, with training module, we also have some, some there are also some complementary, uh, um, or if you want to, for instance, if you take the D8 course registry, which is also a joint project between Clarin and Daria, you can uh, register your course there as, uh, let's say, a course in the digital humanities. And then you can share your resource, uh, your uh, let's say course uh, program and, and slides or uh, exercise or whatever on the marketplace or something like this. Yeah. It can be done in a systematic way. Um, but uh, up to now, but I think Alex or Michelle, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have the capacity to actually look at the quality of the data themselves mm -hmm. or the different um, items themselves. I mean, we are very we are preoccupied with the data, metadata quality, and this is what mm -hmm. we invest efforts uh, on this. But then on the data itself, um, yeah. no, not, at least not for the moment. It's not. Yeah, planned. of course, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned the DH sources, I think, is that because there's a difference between um, um, being kind of a search engine, let's call it like that, um, and, and linking through to the tool. Um, but does DH sources also provide hosting your training materials, for instance? Uh, the DH course registry, no. It's really simply to register the, yeah. the courses or um, programs that you um, have in your institution that is provided. It can be regular ones, like MABA or PhD level, but also like more um, individual, uh, let's say you have organized a workshop or a hands-on session on something, and then you want to register it so that the other people can find it. It's yeah. more finding um, uh, training opportunities than actual material linked to the those yeah. training. 
Yeah, because we were still searching for a place to host it as well. So we can host it ourselves, but then for, in terms of long longevity of the materials. Uh, so if you have any ideas for that, those are welcome as well. But uh, for now, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also had a question in the chat uh, from Teresa, who was wondering about the sustainability of the marketplace, how long we can expect it to last. Um, and uh, someone from the colleague Karen from the editorial board answered that forever and ever, of course, this is what we all hope. So yeah. just in terms of funding, um, of course, it depends on the funding opportunities. But I mean, as anything, uh, as long as we have money, uh, it's possible to have it there. So for the moment, the marketplace is jointly funded by Clarin, uh, Sesta and Daria. Um, and um, we hope to have some other infrastructures in the uh, uh, SSH Open Cluster who would also actively participate to, to fund the marketplace. So this in terms of actual uh, funds, and then of course the in-kind contributions by uh, the technical teams or the technical centers and the um, members of the infrastructures and the editorial boards. So we don't have an end date and we hope to be able to support it as long as possible. Okay, so hey and welcome for me. Um, I'm Michael, I work at the ACDH and part of my job is to look after the marketplace and I'm going to give you a brief introduction on how to create workflows in the marketplace, how to really do that step by step. Um, we're going to start with the workflows for two reasons, because I think one that they're most interesting for you as quite unique items that exist in the marketplace that you can add. And secondly, also because workflows are arguably the hardest item type to add in the marketplace. So once you know how to do that, you can easily add all the other item types as well. And we're just going to do really step-by-step -step approach. So first off, you need to log in to the marketplace so you're able to suggest any items. And we've recently changed how the login works. So if you've used it before, Check again, make sure that you can log in. It is quite straightforward. There's a sign in button. And then there is a federated My Access ID service here. And you should be able to log in with your university or your institution. And if you can't log in through that, we also support uh, a few other logins, most notably Google and Orchid. And one of that should, um, you should be able to log in with that. If there's any trouble, send an email to the help desk email and it will probably come to me and I can help you out. The same as if you had an account maybe a year ago or so and you find you can't log in anymore, that is likely because we have to change how the login works. And same thing, if you like the old account back, we can make that happen. So then once you're logged in, um, there's buttons to create different item types. And if you create if you click create workflow, it takes you to this mask that you see here on the right. And in a way that is also good to understand how items work in the marketplace. So a workflow, Ed, he's on the editorial board. He said a workflow is like a recipe. And I think that's a good way to think about it. So you have this recipe that shows you how to do something given the right ingredients and how to put them together in the right kind of way. And in the same way, like a recipe would have different steps, the workflow would have this start page that gives you an overview of this is what this workflow can do. Same as this is how you make a nice roast for Christmas dinner. And then it would have this, the individual steps that show you, you know, take this, do that, and this should be your outcome. So if you create the workflow, the first thing you'll do is you'll create this landing page where there is a general description of what your workflow does. So label give it a name, description, you can give it a description. Um, this allows markdown, so you can style that a little bit. And then we'll go on to the other sections in a minute and you'll see some are mandatory. They have those little arrows here and some are optional. Uh, quite important that you give it a good name and a good description so people know what your workflow is about. But 
Also, you see here that there is an ID service. So if your workflow is published somewhere else, say, and you want to link that ID, you want to link to DOI or what have you, you can add that here. And then what's quite interesting is that the marketplace supports a large array of different actor roles. So we don't only have authors, we have contributors, we have programmers, we have reviewers. So in that sense, you can just really acknowledge everyone who contributed to that workflow. And it's not only someone who did the writing, but also someone who, who looked after the code or someone who generally helped you make that workflow happen. So you can add as many actors as you like, and you can pick and choose from the roles and you can add them and as contributors to this workflow. I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a second, but generally saying, if you have the workflow, this is what a sample workflow looks like. And we have this meta workflow, right? So this is a workflow on how to create a workflow. It's also a very good place to start because it kind of repeats what I'm saying and it walks you through the different steps on, on how to create the workflow. And it's a good idea for us to understand how these workflows function in the marketplace and what kind of details you can add and what details make sense to add and what all that means. So first off, you see that here, there is a license, there's categorizations, there is context. We'll uh, talk about that a little bit in a second, but you see different contributors. So feel free to really mention everyone who contributed to your workflow and if people are in the marketplace already as contributors, they'll be suggested to you and you can just add them to it. And if they're not in the marketplace already, then you can just add them and they'll be created. So how do you go about making this workflow in a nutshell? Um, the thing is, as I said, the workflow is supposed to be a recipe, right? And just as some recipes are maybe more hands-on than others, it's supposed to be a use case inspired from real life research, something that you really do. So either there is a tool and you want to show how this tool can be applied in a proper way. Maybe there is something that is a, a basic step within your field of research and you just want to document it. So it becomes easier possibly for students. Maybe it is also that you're writing an article and you would just like more space to really demonstrate your methodology than they give you in the article. So instead of just having 10 pictures that the journal might allow you, you could also additionally create this workflow and then link to the workflow in your article because here you'd have all the space you want to document your methodology in detail. It's important that the workflow is reusable, you know, talking about fair data and open data. So what you do should be reusable and you should also be quite specific on the tools, the formats and the methods to use, if possible, link to these tools. I'll show you how to do that in a second. The thing is, at the moment, it is that only one person can have a draft item. So you create a draft workflow and it's going to be visible only to you and the moderators. Once it's approved, it's visible to everyone. But if you want to have uh, to work on a workflow as a team, there is a collaborative template that's linked here and we'll put those slides up so you can find it. But it's essentially a Google Doc, right? That you can share with the team and you can draft out the different steps in the workflow that you want to have and you can draft out what tools you want to uh, relate to the different steps. And then that makes it just a good bit easier to actually create a workflow because you can have all your structure and then before you go into creating that in the marketplace, because as I said, once it's a draft in the marketplace, you can't easily share this with other users. Okay, and then we'll go about making it actually. So describe the workflow, really that's what's going to be here on this landing page. So this is a TI workflow and the description is going to be there just below it. And use the markdown that we support, um, make sure it's accessible. So explain what the acronyms mean. Um, remember the marketplace has people from all sorts of disciplines come to it. So make sure this is accessible and you explain what you're actually doing. And then you can associate general metadata to the workflow. That's just some of the examples that I've been showing you earlier. Just what is interesting. So we have three authors here and they can have different roles. Okay. And then they're going to show up here on the right side in this red box is how this is going to look like in the interface. And then the properties, that's something that's important because the properties 
they feed from some vocabularies and some are open and some are closed. Well, so the keyword, for example, is an open vocabulary that's unique to the marketplace. Um, you can browse the vocabulary, you can just start typing and it will auto autofill if that keyword's in the marketplace and you can just uh, use it for your workflow. If it is not in the marketplace yet, you can suggest a new concept, basically means you suggest a new keyword and then once that is approved, you can add it onto your workflow. All the others, for example, they are um, fed from closed vocabularies. So the most obvious one definitely is the license. We just have a list of licenses and you can select one that applies. You don't have to select one. So if you find um, non applies, you can just leave that out. Same goes with language, pretty obvious. And then activity. So let's look at at activity for a second. For example, activity is based on Tadira, Taxonomy of Digital Research Activities in the Humanities. And that's an example of a closed vocabulary that's used in the marketplace to describe our items. So you can select here one of the entries from Tadira. And again, if you don't want to, or if you feel it makes no sense in this case, you can just delete that and this activity field will simply be gone. But I encourage you to add, try and fill out all the properties that you will see when you create the workflow because it will help others find your resource and it will also help to describe it better. And the same goes for the license. We recommend CC by or CC zero, but it is absolutely up to you how you want to do that. And here is just a demo of how the vocabularies work. So for example, in activity, we're starting to type in data and it's going to show us all the entries, visualization, mapping, mining. And you see that is just fed from Tadira. And here you see all the vocabularies that we use. Um, you don't have to know them off, uh, but it is important. It might be helpful for you to understand where those entries come from. So wherever possible, we try to use existing vocabularies so that we don't invent our own vocabularies that only work within the marketplace. Sometimes uh, we just have to, for example, keywords, uh, pretty obvious that we just we have our own sets of keywords because they're quite marketplace specific. And here you can add, but all the others are usually closed and you can just help to you can just use them to describe the workflow. And then remember how we had different item types in the marketplace. And for different item types, there is different sets of recommended and mandatory metadata that is, um, yeah, that we're looking for. Same here, there's a page in the marketplace that explains that in detail and also explains in detail what these fields actually mean. So for example, accessible ad, okay, that's the value that will show at the go to button. All right, and then other things, just explain what actually we're looking for in that field. Um, we only really have, let's say we really have three, right? You need to have a label, you need to have a description. You technically do not need to have a URL that has somewhat historical reasons, but in practice, you know, you want to have a URL at your item, otherwise no one can actually access the item. So that's also a good page to look at while you're planning, say your workflow, because it will just show you what metadata we recommend you add, and it will also show you what vocabulary is connected to that field. And you can just start thinking about, okay, what do I want um, to have here for my workflow? And then just one thing about the actors. I said you can add actors and they have can have all sorts of roles and that's good. But what actors can also have is an ID from an ID service such as ORCID for example. And that's quite ex important. And I recommend that you do this for every actor that you add to the marketplace because it helps to identify actors. You can imagine Sometimes people might just have pretty generic names and there might be five pers five people with that name in the marketplace. Or someone spells here Karlheinz Mert, someone might spell it Mert Karlheinz and put it in there. So, you know, last name, first name versus first name, last name, so on and so forth. Or the person might have a middle name and then you have three different entries and it would be up to the data creation team to figure out are these three different people or is it just the same person, just and the name is spelled differently three times. 
So really add an actor. And then I think pretty much everyone has an ORCID these days. ORCID is one of the best choices here because it's just a unique identifier. And then it's really clear who that person is, who you're talking about. Um, actors can also be associated with uh, person groups and bodies, for example. For example, Karl-Heinz Merritt, he might be associated with the ACDHCH. So an institution, a department, a funding body, you're quite free here to, to um, enter whatever seems appropriate to you. So that also, if you work in a small team that only exists for a short period of time, you can add that here as the affiliation and it will just be clear what's the context that this resource was created in. Grant, and then we move on to actually creating the workflow. You can have an illustration that is what's going to show up as, you know, the standard picture once you click on it. So you are open to just pick something that makes sense for you, have screenshots, that's okay. Make sure that you have a permissive license and make sure that you have a caption on it so that the site is accessible. Generally, okay, we'll go through there. And once you have created your standard workflow, you can go on to the next part which is the steps of the workflow, right? We talked about you have the standard landing page that describes what the workflow does. And as a next part, a workflow can have different steps. Um, one step, one action, you can have as many actions, as many steps as you like. Recommendation is not to exceed 10 steps because it just becomes too long. And you can, you know, add as you can see that here, you add a step, you can move it up and down, you can, uh, edit the step and you can just figure out how many steps make sense for your workflow. That's what I said. It's probably a good idea to start by drafting it out because it will become clear to you how many steps do you need and how should those steps be broken down. But at any point, you can come back to the workflow. You can add more steps. You can take a step out. You can uh, change the order of the steps as you like. And then one of the reasons why I think the workflow is actually a very good item type for you to look at is because in the marketplace, items can be related to each other. So for example, a workflow is related to all the tools that I mentioned and used in the workflow. And it's important, these relations are important because they help people find new resources and tools. So they click at your workflow and then they might see a list of tools that you have used in this workflow and they show up as related items. So try uh, and identify the relevant resources. Again, when you kind of draft out your steps that you just write down what tools you're using. If you use a public data source, write down what data source you're using and then go and check if they're in the marketplace already, that's great. And you can just go on and add them. If they're not in the marketplace already, um, you can create them if it makes sense for these items to be in the marketplace. And if you find it doesn't make sense for these items to be in the marketplace, then you can also see use the see also property. I'll show you what that is in a minute. But generally, you want to have build relations wherever possible, right? That's one of the strengths of the marketplace is that you can have a lot of different resources that are have relations to each other in like a social knowledge graph kind of way that it helps other people find new tools. So if you do that, if you do add related items, they're going to show up here under the step. So this is step four, for example, and it has three related items. And these are all items that are in the marketplace. So a user can click on that and it takes them to that entry. If you put something as C also, you see it here on the right under context, then that's where these URLs go that you put as C also. For C also, you don't need to create anything. You just put the URL there and it's going to show up and people can click on it. That's a good place to put, for example, documentation or it's just further information or you know a website or maybe the GitHub of something. Whatever you think makes sense to, to put that here as context, but also what you think doesn't really warrant its own entry in the marketplace. Same thing here is, for example, you see that keywords have been associated to that workflow and they're showing up here on the keywords. And if users click on the keyword, it's going to show them other entries 
that have the same keyword. So that way it's, it's really helpful to facilitate that discoverability. Uh, kind of important that you can have these relations for every step so that it doesn't become overwhelming. So for each step, you can just show the tools and the data that you're using for that step. And that way, you know, if you have five or six steps and each step has two or three relations, it doesn't become overwhelming as a list. So your user can easily see what is being used in that step. Okay, and then really to wrap this up, if you create a workflow, then you're already mastering probably the most complicated item create form. All the others, they work very similarly, but they don't have the steps obviously, right? So the workflow is where you can really document the research project, a use case. If you have a tool that you want to showcase that the workflow is a good place to do that. A research scenario, if you want to document your methodology, that's a good place to put it. If you're teaching and it's something that you always do, you know, like every semester, and you just want to document that so you can point your students to that resource, also a good idea to have a workflow about it. So think about what the workflow should be. Use the template, draft it down. If there's other people involved, make sure everyone is happy with how the workflow is going to look like. Um, log in, create the workflow as we said. You can add the steps, add as many steps as make sense to you. Make sure that you create those related resources. And you know you might have to create the resources first so that they can be linked to the workflow. You might decide that the links should just go into C also. And finally, save that as a draft. Make sure you save it so you don't lose it. Once you're happy with it, submit it. Uh, once it's submitted, it goes to the moderation queue and then somebody from the editorial board will uh, approve it or will contact you to further discuss that. And just usually when, when we do these kind of things, we ask people to add a bit more context. Uh, we try to look at it with like a fresh pair of eyes and say, could you add this or that? So this, it's become a bit easier to understand what the workflow is about. We're generally not mean. Uh, so we're really trying to help you. If you have the workflow there, then we're just trying to help you make it as good as it can be. And yeah, once the workflow is published, then it's out there for everyone to see. You will get a stable URL that you can just either link to or that you can send on to others. You can also come back to the workflow at any point and just make edits to it. So for example, if it's a uh, a research workflow for something that's just in the making and you find that you want to add another step, then you can always come back to it at any point in time and you just do the edits to the entry, submit it again, and once it's approved, the new workflow is there. And yeah, that was a really brief introduction in how to create resources in general on the marketplace, uh, more specifically how to create the workflows and the workflows are definitely the ones that might take the longest where you want to draft it out first, where you just want to make sure everything makes sense before you go on creating that. So if you do have any more questions, you can always reach out to us, the editorial board, or, and you should also come of course to the annual conference because we're having a hands-on workshop there and we will have way more time to help you uh, conceptualize and starting to draft the workflows for the marketplace. Yeah. Bram, you have a question? Yeah, sorry, me again. Uh, just a quick question this time. Uh, in terms of the licenses, can you specify a custom license as well? Uh, it's a closed vocabulary, so you can't specify a custom license if it's not in there. Um, but there is a field terms of use that you can yeah, use. There's a, yeah, exactly. There's a field that's it's called terms of use URL, and you can just link to that That's custom fine. license, if if you feel it's not in the vocab. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a question in the chat from Piotr. A uh, question from the usability or ah. user feedback angle. How can a user report a broken link? Uh, for oh. instance, it gives the example of a broken link. Yeah. If, if you look on the top next to where it says your name, it says, hi, well, hi, Michael, or hi, your name, and then it says report an issue. So if you're on the, the item page with the issue and you click on report an issue, um, it will pre-fill this form where it says, I have found an issue and it will give you the marketplace ID. Thanks. Is Piotr this answer 
satisfactory for you. Good. Thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah. And please do that. If you see a broken link, please uh, use that. It will come to us. We do that regularly. We scan for broken links. But uh, sure, there's always the odd one that we haven't found yet. Isn't there also the option um, if you have the contributor role? I mean, if you log in, that as a user, you can actually contribute to curating some of the. Um, is is this something that Piotr could have done by himself, for instance, or instead of reporting? Mm -hmm. I mean, just because he has the question. Yeah, you so. can also suggest an edit by replacing the the wrong link with the right one if you know it. So that makes, oh, yeah. makes life a bit easier for us. Yeah, <laughs> then it will add up as better, a new yeah. version in the in the motivation queue for us, and then we can just need mm -hmm. click. Ah, wait, thanks. Okay. Yeah. That, that's part of this curation collective effort or community effort that we uh, appreciate so much where anyone using their contributor account can actually um, um, curate any of the fields and then the editorial board um, get a notification and we, we validate it after having uh, checked it. And maybe that's also very useful, as I said, when we have mass ingestions and there might be uh, either some fields which are um, erroneous or missing. And if it's a tool that you know or have used and uh, you feel that you want to contribute to this metadata and, and put it in there, that's also possible. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Leah. So uh, I just wanted to ask, um, it's really uh, interesting. So if um, as a researcher, I would use some of the workflows uh, so as an inspiration or as really a guide, can I also comment it? I, I Sorry, I haven't used it yet. So can I say, uh, yes, it was really helpful, or this step is a little bit problematic, um, or feedback it, for example, or something like that? Or do I have to, is it like directly integrated the feedback that I can give, or do I have to look for the name for the author um, and to feedback it via this way? Thanks, Leah. Michelle, do you have an answer? Yeah. You you can't do that through the marketplace at the moment. So you could, if the person has their profile, reach out to them and give them whatever praise or concern. Um, but we, you can't do it for the marketplace. That has a number of reasons. And the way we handle user data is one of them. But we can't do it for the marketplace at the moment. Yeah, just, just maybe to fill in while someone else maybe thinks, uh, thinks of another question. Um, what we have done also as the editorial board that we organized um, some some specific workshops in which people could um, conceptualize and build their workflows. We've done one recently in Switzerland in well in the Daria CH community, and there were also some um, on site. Uh, so that was an online workshop. Uh, we also had ones in France a few months ago and in Germany. So also link to different events that are or conferences that are all happening to have these uh, hands-on workshops to actually meet us and to work uh, together with um, researchers or data management experts or uh, yeah any other person who is interested in, in creating workflows. And that's something that also we could offer or would like to offer also in the maybe next year to have some kind of a series of um, uh, online events open to, to anyone and focusing on different aspects. Uh, so if someone is interested to organize such a workshop for a specific community, for instance, that you are representing and you think you, they will highly benefit of learning a bit more, uh, don't feel, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, because we can also organize such um, more targeted, let's say, internal um, events yeah, you can always, as, as was said, you can always reach out to us um, either through the marketplace as a contact button there or through the, the email address that we provided at the end of the presentation. And we're always happy to help. Then, thank you for attending. Hope a lot of you will also come to our hands-on workshop at the annual conference in only a couple of weeks. There's still spots there. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, I think that's it. Thanks a lot for attending and see you at the next time.